we are going to talk about decision trees. This is one of the many videos that we will have for individual supervised learning approaches. So what are decision trees? Decision trees are a series of decision nodes that repeatedly split the data set, the given instances, into subunits, into chunks, based on specific feature values. These feature values are the ones that you decide on. That is, the, that is part of the decision node. And once you make a decision, you split the given data into smaller chunks. And you do that repeatedly. Decision trees are widely used approaches for classification uh, because they give competitive perform performance, they have very efficient training approaches, and they produce interpretable models. Uh, in fact, uh, these uh, have been in uh, kind of uh, in research or in use uh, since 1983. So they are they are uh, time tested models that continue to be kind of performing very well. We are going to use for this video uh, the example data set that you have that we have seen earlier on buying health insurance. This data set has fourteen instances numbered 1 to 14. Uh, each instance has uh, four features. Uh, so X the uh, has four features, uh, has dimensionality of four, age, income, student, and health condition. All four of them are uh, either binary or categorical features. So they are not numeric features uh, for now. Um, age has three possible values, less than 25, between 26 and 40, and above 40. Income, again, has three values, low, medium, or high. Student is a yes-no uh, feature, a binary feature. And similarly, health condition is a binary feature. Uh, values can be either fair or excellent. Based on this data set, uh, there are two possible, uh, one of two possible outcomes. Uh, so it's a binary classification task, uh, whether uh, the, the particular instance is a positive instance of person buying insurance or a negative instance, person does not buy insurance. So in our data set, uh, there are 14 instances, nine of them are positive, uh, yes, and five of them are no. So what that means is if you look at uh, the, the buys column, there are nine instances with yes for the decision and five for no, right? So that's what the entire data set is. Suppose you choose of the four, op four features, age, health condition, student, or... Um, whether they are whether the income level is low, medium, or high, right? Of these four options, uh, let's choose age as our first node or uh, first decision node. Age has three possible values: less than twenty-five, between twenty-six and forty, and greater than forty. So these instances that you have originally, the fourteen instances, you are going to split them into smaller groups depending on which of those instances are related to age less than 25 okay so numbers 1 2 8 9 and 11 are all less than 25 so that's your age column and then uh, you just basically um, selecting those instances out of the 14 and plopping them on the left side of your uh, decision tree for 26 to 40 we have instances 3 7 12 and 13 and then on greater than 40, we have the remaining 5, 4, 5, 6, 10, and 14 that go on the, uh, the right-hand side. When you do this, uh, let's, uh, you, you do it because you are now seeing whether there are additional patterns that you can use to kind of split data further. So let's take the middle one, the 26 to 40. If you look at the bias column here, it's all yes, right? So what that means is no matter what any of the other variables are, if your age group is between 26 and 40, all instances in your set buy insurance. So the label is yes. You don't even have to look at other features here. If you look at something uh, less than in, in less than 25, there are five uh, instances it is a combination of no's and yeses. There are three no's, two yeses. Uh, on the ones that are greater than 40, there are uh, three yeses and two no's. But now that you have uh, split it, you only have to focus on these five instances. Let's say the, the less than 25 uh, group, the left branch. And see 
that they all are less than 20, the age is less than 25. Do you find any other attribute, feature, that can be used to split it such that all the uh, buys equal to no come uh, in one group and all buys equal to yes come in one group? Yeah, in fact, you have student uh, as that feature. So if student is no, buys is no. If student is yes, buys is yes. So all of a sudden, you know that if age is less than 25, the only feature that really appears to have to matter is whether they are student or not. If they are not a student, then they don't buy insurance. If they are a student, they do buy insurance. Can you find any such uh, feature in the right hand side on the right hand side that is if when when age is greater than 40 something where buys is yes for uh, if the if the variable is of particular uh, value and it's no when it's something else uh yeah in fact you have one here so health condition is an example so if health condition is fair they buy insurance and if health condition is excellent they don't buy insurance because they say, ah, my health is pretty good, so I don't need to get insurance. And so probably they, they don't. So here you go. You have suddenly split your 14 instances, first with the attribute age into three smaller chunks and uh, either made a decision right away or with one more decision kind of created your table. So you have, uh, this is a decision tree. All the leaf nodes are decision uh, are uh, homogeneous in our case, right? All the leaf nodes are uh, class labels, yes or no. And the internal nodes are all decision points based on a particular uh, variable. Once you have created this decision tree, and this is it. So this is, this is your model. Your model is look at age first. Uh, if it is less than 25, look at student and make a decision. If it's between 26 and 40, just make a decision, yes. If it's greater than 40, look at health condition and then make a decision, right? Um, so when you have an unseen example, so uh, so once you have built your model, now it's in the testing phase and you get a new instance like this. Uh, oh, uh, before we do that. So uh, you not only have the, t the table, but you also know how many instances went through this route. Okay, so there were there were 14 uh, at the top, uh, nine yeses, five noes. And then uh, when it go down, when it went down the student, uh, the less than 25 branch, uh, five instances came in, two yeses, three noes. Um, and uh, if you further split them, really all three noes went into the no branch, all two. Uh, yeah, both both yeses went to the, the right branch, the yes branch, right? And so on. So once you have that and you see an example, a new instance um, that is age less than 25, income is high, student is yes, and the condition is fair, um, you can use this decision tree to make a choice, so to, to make, a, make a class label. Uh, so for example, here, because uh, the tree first asks for age and age is less than 25, it goes down this left branch then you don't really need to look for income or health condition you're just looking at student student is yes so it has to it takes the right branch after that and then the it gets to a decision um, a label node and that label node is yes so your uh, your classification label for this instance is yes so this is how you would use the decision tree to label unseen instances in your test phase right pretty simple Okay, um, is this the only tree possible? No. So if you had not chosen age as your first column, suppose your first node, suppose you had chosen student as your first node, then you would have had, uh, again, the same 14 instances up there, nine yeses, five noes. Student can be a yes or a no uh, split. If student is not, uh, if it's not a student, then seven instances go down that route. There are three yeses, four noes. If the student is yes, the other seven instances go down that route. Uh, six of them are yeses, one of them is no, right? So uh, on the left branch, you have to make a choice. Let's say you choose age to split it further uh, between 
uh, so a is less than 25 between 26 and 40 and greater than 40 uh, the less than 25 is all no's so there are three instances that way 26 to 40 is also uh, all yeses uh, there are again two instances there and greater than 40 there are two instances one of them is yes one of them is no so you cannot make a decision at this point so you're going to use another uh, decision node this that be health condition if it's fair uh, it is going to be yes uh, one of the instances fall down that route and if it is excellent it is no and then the other uh, other condition kind of falls on that route okay on the uh, go back to the topmost node uh, if the branch and you take down the branch one or uh, the branch yes that means if the student is uh, if, if this person is a student then there are seven instances coming in that uh, branch you choose income to be the splitting criteria it's low medium high uh, when income is medium uh, there are two instances both of them are yeses when the income is high there is one instance uh, which is a yes so you, you can label it right away but when the income is low uh, there are four instances three of them are yeses one of them is no so you have to go down further let's look at age if age is less than 25 uh, you have one instance coming down that route uh, label is yes if age is between 26 and 40 another instance coming down that route uh, again label is yes but then when age is greater than 40 there are two instances one of them positive one of them are negative so you're not done yet you cannot make a decision you have to use the other final variable which is health condition and then split it if it is fair then the label is yes if it's excellent label is no so you did create a decision tree where again all the leaf nodes are are labeled nodes uh, they are all homogeneous um, all the internal nodes are uh, decision nodes so so it is a complete tree however you can see that this tree is way more complex than the previous tree right uh, here really for any decision you need to make you have to have at least two uh two variables that you need to check for some instances further down here uh, the last two that we did the split on you are looking at all four variables there are only four variables for every instance student income age health condition you're basically looking at each of them before you can make a final decision so clearly this is a more complex uh, tree than the previous one so then the question is what makes a tree a good tree how why do you want to learn a tree that is more uh, succinct or kind of a, a clearer tree um, you prefer smaller trees because you are making decisions based on fewer variables and hence you may have the model that's more generalizable so if you go down and look at every possible instance and you kind of really have two instances that you cannot distinguish and you have to use all variables to come to a conclusion that is a very very detailed tree and uh, it is prone to errors that kind of a tree is called or is, is something that's called overfitting data right so you do not want to um, to go down that uh, i mean try to avoid overfitting on your training data because um, that would not generalize well when you have unseen test instances uh, you may find many more mistakes if you have a more complex model um, so so this is called uh, the the notion this this rule of thumb that can kind of say simpler model or smaller trees are better is called occam's razor um, and the and that is typically kind of one that prefers smaller models compared to more complex models that uh, that need um, a lot of decisions before a final choice can be made okay the other uh, parameter or, or criteria that you would use to choose a good tree is how accurate the trees are both of our trees were 100 percent accurate but you could have a tree that is not necessarily 100 percent accurate but still a very simple tree and uh, then uh, a simpler tree with that makes some mistakes is maybe still preferred uh, as long as the uh, it, it does not make too many mistakes right the accuracy level is still very high uh, you may be able to live with uh, a few errors if it generates smaller tree so an example of that is if you remember this tree uh, we created the left branch and when we came to the right branch there were seven instances six of them were yeses one was 
No. But to get that one out, you had to go through four levels of decision. And that was the last point was when the, the depending on health condition being fair and excellent, it got split into one positive and one negative. So of all of that branch, all the decision, uh, uh, the, the label nodes were yeses, except that one instance of no. So uh, you had to do, uh, so instead of doing all of that, if you had actually just made a decision here saying, ah, I'm just going to call this uh, label as yes, I will make a mistake on one out of the 14 instances, but that would stop me from growing a tree that is very, very detailed and uh, really um, doing that only for the sake of getting this one negative instance uh, correctly labeled. Uh, and so, so that would be one way to kind of this, this tree uh, with this pruning is a better tree compared to the other one that we created with was 100% uh, accurate. Okay, great. So how do you build a good tree? You have to, uh, you, even if you had chosen this tree, this tree has more decisions uh, and making less mistakes uh, than than the other tree. Well, in, in fact, it is not really that many different decisions. Uh, it still has three decision nodes. The other one also had three decision nodes. Um, but um, so so even though, but, but this is clearly making more mistakes than the other tree, right? So um, we still have the tree that has age at the topmost root is a better tree. So how do you build that tree? Um, the, the key is in choosing the best attribute to split a node. The fact that splitting on student was a, a wrong choice at this point, splitting on age was the right choice is, uh, is an indication that that the attribute that you choose to split a node becomes critical. The, the reasoning of what is considered a, a good attribute to split on depends on whether the nodes that you create, whether the children that you create, the, the splits that you make of your data set are more homogeneous than the current node. Okay, So when you have the overall data set that had 14 instances, but you split into three where a chunk of them, four of them were, uh, were, uh, were all yes classes, right? When age was between 26 and 40. Kind of shows that that is a homogeneous group uh, home, uh, of, of four instances. And then the other two that were um, five instances each were both kind of equally split like three, two. Uh, three yeses, two noes in one instance, three yeses, two no, uh, three noes, two yeses in the other instance. Um, so this split is better because it kind of created homogeneous group and then uh, the other split became again created a homogeneous group right away and then you had you could uh, stop after one more decision on both of these other branches. So um, the the measures that you can use to kind of choose splits that create homogeneous children. Uh, are uh, kind of two of them. One is called one is entropy gain, or also known as information gain, and the other one is Gini index. Um, so when you uh, build your models, when you use um, R to kind of create models, you can specify what kind of uh, measure you would want to use to split a, a, a node, right? to create the attribute to kind of uh, best attribute uh, to create a node. Uh, and you could specify either information gain or Gini index there. Both of them are kind of slightly different mathematical formulations, but they prefer homogeneous children. Uh, and, and the more homogeneous the children are, the better the value. And that's what you use here. Okay, um, so to kind of bring together this algorithm of creating a decision tree uh, or building this tree step by step, uh, decision tree algorithm is a greedy divide and conquer approach. What does that mean? A greedy approach is that you make a best choice at a given instance and you stick to it, right? So uh, you, you, you do a split, you choose the best attribute to do the split. Once you have done the split, you're not going to go back. It's just going to kind of continue further. Divide and conquer comes that once you do the split, you have split the problem into smaller problems and then you do the same on smaller problems. So, so you, your big problem is split into smaller chunks and hence you are dividing it and then you're conquering those individual components uh, you're doing the same thing on the smaller components and then the best option for the smaller component creates the best option for the whole uh, data set right um, so step-by-step -step processes you're first going to look at the class distribution uh, at a node 
right? Uh, so when you're creating it at the root node, for example, uh, in our case, it was nine yeses, five, uh, five noes. Uh, if that node is homogeneous, that uh, that means if if you have uh, if you have all of them of the same class, or if there are no more attributes remaining to, for, for you to split on, then you just label the node by the majority class and move on. Uh, if there is an attribute that you could split on and the and the node is not homogeneous, then you're going to pick the best attribute to split that uh, that node. Create the children node and then split the instances uh, based on those values, based on the attribute values, and then repeat the same process on each child node. Uh, the best attributes could have chosen were based on one that maximizes homogeneity, either using entropy gain or Gini. Once you have created this tree, uh, the biggest advantage of a decision tree is that it is it creates interpretable models. And more so, it, you can actually create decision rules based on a tree. So for example, from this tree, you can say that if age is um, between 26 and 40, the label is yes, right? So age equals 26 to 40 implies label yes. Uh, when you have rules like this, you, you quantify those using two measures. One is called support. That means how many instances come down that way. How many instances are the, uh, have the, the first part, the antecedent of the uh, rule uh, match, match those. Okay, So 4 out of 14 instances have this age 26 to 40. How do you know that? You know that based on how many come, came down this path. Uh, and confidence is uh, when you apply it on the instances uh, on which it is relevant, how, uh, how strong is the rule? So how accurate is the rule, right? So confidence in this case is 100% because uh, all four instances that come down follow this rule. So the confidence is 4 over 4. Another rule could be if your age is less than 25 and student is no, the label is no. Three instances come down that path. So three out of 14 is a support and confidence is 100% again. You could have uh, rules coming from other trees too. So uh, remember the tree that we kind of uh, pruned uh, where you made a student choice early on. So if the student is yes uh, and the label that we assigned uh, was yes. So for that branch, seven instances came down that path. So the support was 50%, seven over 14. And uh, it, this rule was correct in six out of the seven instances uh, because there was one instance coming down that path which was actually no. Student was yes, but the label was no, right? So the confidence in this case would be six over seven. So uh, this is kind of uh, a way for, for me to kind of show you that uh, decision trees by themselves are in interesting, but they can create these rules uh, and those rules might itself be interesting. Now here in, in this case, you can see clearly that age and student appear to be kind of more uh, useful features uh, that, uh, that, are, um, that are stronger features for, for, this class, for this data set. Okay, so now let's look at possible issues that can come with a decision tree. One, one problem could be a missing attribute. So you have this tree, and for an instance, uh, let's so you have created this tree already. So now you are at the inference stage, at the testing stage, and your instance is one where age is less than twenty five, income is high, health condition is fair, but you don't know whether they are a student or not. So that particular value is unknown. How would that change the labeling? So you would still use the the tree and so you'll go down the path for age. So age is less than 25, so it takes the left branch and then your decision has to be on student. But you don't know the label. So at this point, you cannot, you don't know whether to go down the no path or the yes path. Uh, the way decision trees handle this is by saying at this point, choose the majority label. Okay, so there were two yeses, three noes coming down this path. So the majority is no. I'm going to call this particular uh, instance as no. Because there are more chances of uh, somebody who is age less than 25 to be to not be a student. Right? There are more chances that they are not a student as compared to that they are a student. And 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm right. Yeah. So, so there are more chances that the person is not a student because there are three instances of people who are less than 25 who are not a student from a data set. So, um, uh, and, and you go down that path and the label is no for them. So my label here would be no as well. Okay. Um, so what does that uh, mean? So uh, when, so the, the reason why you keep these numbers is that you are kind of saying of the options, whatever option you take going down the path. So if you had made a choice of student being yes or no, you, you, uh, another way to kind of think about this would be that you go down both paths and see what is the likelihood of the label coming, turning up to be yes or no. Okay. Uh, using, using other values and so on. Uh, you could do that way, or you could just choose the one that, uh, because student was a more important feature compared to health condition, right? Uh, for, for if, if you know that the age is less than 25. So if you don't know what a student label is, just pick the majority class. You are going to be less uh, error prone by doing that way. What is worth noting is suppose the age was greater than 40. It doesn't matter whether they were student or not, right? So if the age was greater than 40, you would have gone down the right path, uh, gone to a node which is health condition. You know the health condition was fair and you would have given the label as yes. So uh, this is the other beauty of kind of decision trees. The missing values, missing attribute values become important only if it is a critical node at, in, in the path of decision. If, if that was not even a relevant feature, it doesn't really matter and you still would have made a decision. And so uh, that's why it's very robust for missing attributes. What would have happened if age was unknown? If age was unknown, uh, you would have used, again, the majority class. The same rule applies. And in case you would have called this uh, label as yes, because nine instances out of 14 uh, right at the top were yes. So the the default, major, the majority class uh, baseline would have applied here, right? Good, great. So that's how you handle uh, the issue of missing attributes. Next, how do you handle continuous variables? Uh, this is interesting because if you note, uh, if you remember, I said that our data set was one where all of them were categorical attributes. They had, uh, even age was, was, grouped such that it was less than 25 between 26 and 40 and greater than 40, right? Even though age itself is a numeric value. But what if you had variables, uh, in this case, I'm just calling them X and Y, you could call them X1, X2, um, that were numeric. Well, uh, decision trees can handle continuous variables. So in this, for this particular data set that is that has green points and red points, uh, you can see maybe that uh, one of the kind of good splits might be X is greater than two or less than two. So you are going to use the same idea of splitting on X and you can split uh, and you can make this continuous variable as a decision node by having a threshold value. So you were saying, I'm going to choose a threshold of two and then make a choice if the if X is greater than two or less than two. So it suddenly becomes a binary split after that, right? If, uh, and so let's, uh, for our nomenclature, let's say uh, yes is always the right branch, okay? So if X is greater than two, we choose whether Y is greater than two. Uh, and if X is greater than two and Y is greater than two, that's the right branch to that would be uh, a red branch, correct? Because all uh, points that are uh, x greater than 2 and y greater than 2 are all red points. Perfect. What if y uh, is less than 2? So that is the section, the lower uh, half uh, of the section of x greater than 2, where you have seven green points, but you also have four red, uh, five red points right in the middle of them. So you have to then split based on whether X is greater than three or less than three. If X is less than three, it's a green point. If X is greater than three, you have to make another choice for X uh, greater than or less than four. And now you can say for sure that if X is less than four, it's a red point. If it's greater than four, it's a green point. 
Good. So, so this side of uh, case when x was greater than 2 is 100. What happens if x is less than 2? If x is less than 2, you have many, many green points and you have this one red point between 2.5 and 2.6, where y is uh, between 2.5 and 2.6. So, you have to uh, create a tree that kind of takes that sliver out. Uh, you're saying that if y is greater than 2.5, check whether it is greater than 2.6 or not. Uh, if uh, y is greater than 2.6 as well, it's a green. If it's less than 2.6 but greater than 2.5, it's a red. And if it's uh, less than 2.5, y is less than 2.5, it's a green again. Right? So, so this again is your complete tree. Uh, this is also a 100% accurate tree. What do you see about the way the this, this quadrant x, y kind of space was split? You'll notice that decision tree is splitting them in um, basically rectangles, right? Uh, it's called quadrilinear kind of model, which is basically kind of saying you have small uh, line segments that are separating them. So, so they are all going to be ortho, uh, orthogonal to the x, y axis. So you're going to have parallel and perpendicular lines that are uh, splitting this, this space. Um, so that's an important kind of feature of a decision tree. The decision tree is always going to kind of take this space and split them into rectangles and then give assign labels to those rectangles. Okay, good. So that's how you handle uh, the uh, handle continuous variables. So uh, decision tree handles continuous attributes by splitting them into two or more intervals. Uh, again, how do you find the best threshold to split? you use the same idea, this is the information gain or Gini index as you are measured to kind of do it. So you will find out what is a split, is split of one uh, x1 uh, one better, is x1.5 better, is x2 better. And then make by doing that choice, you can see which, which of the thresholds gives you the best split. And then you'll use that as your split in, in, the, in, in creating the decision tree. So in, in, in learning the decision tree. Good. Um, but then the this kind of is a good example to talk about issue number three. So even if decision trees can handle continuous variables well, it still is prone to this issue of overfitting, right? Just like we saw it in the previous example where you had to do a lot of things to kind of get one instance right. Here too, you'll see that the when when x is less than two, there are many, many green points and just one red point. But to get that one red point out, you have to kind of take out a sliver of um, uh, region and you have to define it by two decisions uh, uh, before you can come to that one. What if that actually um, was a mislabel, right? Or, or something else. So, so this is an instance of something that you are, uh, f that decision trees are, are uh, kind of have a, uh, unfortunately a limitation on and that is that you can always build a tree that is 100 percent accurate uh, provided you have sufficient uh, instances to get a, uh, get a or sufficient dimensionality of your data if, if you have attributes to split on it will choose one of those and split on it and keep splitting until it cannot uh, split anymore right uh, but then if you uh, so this is kind of the leads to possible overfitting if you actually did not create this tree and say, I'm going to call all of this really a green node and by, by pruning this entire tree and just calling that tree as green uh, node, you are going to make one mistake. So of all of these points, 25 points or so, one mistake would have still given you an easier, simpler tree. And this would be a much simpler tree compared to the previous one. So this is how it handles overfitting. So the key takeaways from decision tree is that uh, it is a greedy divide and conquer approach to build trees. It is a very efficient way to do it. So uh, the best attribute can be chosen using either information gain or Gini index. You uh, you create these trees uh, and they result in interpretable models. So you can come up with rules, for example, or even the trees are very interpretable way of uh, explaining what the model is. Uh, it handles missing valuable values and uh, continuous variables really well. Uh, they are prone to overfitting though, but that effort can be reduced significantly by pruning. So uh, decision trees end up becoming very strong baseline models for machine learning approaches using supervised machine learning. And they work very well when you have um, 
when you have multiple variables coming from different different uh, areas so for example multiple tests and so on uh, and in fact they are so powerful that you can group the m m m multiple decisions together uh, to create a stronger classifier as well and we're going to talk about those uh, in a few weeks